What is up, freaks? It's your boy Marty Bent here to introduce this episode of Tales from the Crypt. I sat down with Michael Saylor from MicroStrategy, Darren Feinstein from BlockCap, Austin Storms, who's our head engineer at Great American Mining. We sat down to talk about the Bitcoin Mining Council and ESG. Big back and forth. What's going on here? You guys are going to listen to the conversation. You may have listened to it already during the live stream. We had a live stream for this last night. Yeah, my mind's racing after it too. I guess um, one thing I'd like to comment on before we jump into this episode is uh, a comment made by Michael Saylor towards the end of the conversation about picking battles. And I think it's a, I agree. We have to pick our battles wisely. Uh, and should we be battling with the ESG narrative, right? Is this a wise battle to choose? Is it uh, distracting from lower hanging fruit that could be taken care of? In the meantime, I would argue, I, I do think, I do think this is a battle worth picking because if we don't pick it now, it's just going to be uh, much harder to fight in the future if ESG is successful in using the trillions and trillions of dollars of capital uh, in its war chest to co-opt a section of the Bitcoin industry, not even just mining. You can extend ESG to a bunch of other companies, including one of the sponsors, Cash App. Square is publicly traded. They have shareholders as well. They could be beholden to ESG at some point. Unwillingly. Um, so therefore, is this a battle worth picking? I would argue yes. You're going to listen to the debate. I don't know if it was a debate. There's no moderator. Conversation back and forth. Understanding why the Mining Council exists, what it's trying to achieve, and whether or not uh, it makes sense to appease ESG investors. As mentioned, this rip was brought to you by our good friends at the motherfucking Cash App. Cash App's help you stack sets, send sets, receive sets, and sell sets if you so please we're saying sets, 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 because sets are the standard. There's 100 million sets in one whole Bitcoin. You don't want to buy a whole Bitcoin. You don't want to buy a fraction of a Bitcoin. You can stack whole sets. Instead, Cash App makes it extremely easy. You can DCA into sets. That's dollar cost average. Cash App can even be your bank account. They're offering account numbers and routing numbers. You get your paychecks direct deposited into the app to help. You DCA into sats. You can DCA, I didn't mention it, daily, weekly, or bi-weekly. Set it and forget it. Uh, they also have their boost program. And then they give you uh, a debit card's accepted. Anywhere the visa's accepted, Cash App. If you haven't downloaded it yet, make sure you use the code stacking sats. That's S-T-A-C-K-I-N-G-S-A-T-S. You're going to get $10. And $10 is going to go to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. That's Owls Lacrosse. Owls Lacrosse. This rip was also brought to you by our good friends at Hoddle Hoddle. Hoddle Hoddle is here to bring you freaks a lending platform. Again, a lending platform that is non custodial. It's available to U.S. clients, and U.S. customers as well. One of the few Hoddle Hoddle products available to us U.S. citizens who are bogged down by over regulation in the financial sector. Uh, how does it work? How does it work, you ask? Well, you put your Bitcoin up as collateral in a two or three multi-sig escrow. You hold one key. Your counterparty in the loan holds one key. And HODL HODL holds the third key. Uh, use that collateral to get stablecoin liquidity. And then you can go use that liquidity as you see fit. As long as you're paying back the loan, uh, you're going to get your sats back at the, at the end of the loan. Once that's all paid back, plus interest. Uh, the beauty of the, the not custodial two or three multi-sig escrow uh, that your collateral is held in throughout the duration of the loan is that you have the ability to see that wallet since you have one key and you can uh, have confidence that your sats aren't being rehypothecated. So you can check in on that multi-sig escrow and say, hey, my sats are here. Uh, hodl hodl and my counterparty aren't taking risks with those sats. So I have confidence that I'm going to get it back when I pay that loan back. So if you're short of funds, you don't need to sell your Bitcoin again. Get some liquidity by borrowing using your Bitcoin as collateral. Uh, no KYC, no AML. Uh, you can use this globally, anonymously, on your own terms. If you have some stable coins laying around, you want to get some yield on those, you can enter the other side of that order book and put your 
uh, stable coins up to be lent out to get interest back on that. So create your offers and set your own terms today on lend.hodlhodl.com. That's lend.hodlhodl.com. This rip is also brought to you by our good friends at Compass Mining. Compass Mining is here to get more individuals into the mining game. And the way they do this is they have very good relationships with ASIC manufacturers. They allow you to go to compassmining.io, which is their website. Uh, you can buy an ASIC. You can have it sent to you at home and uh, just plug it in wherever you want. Or if you want to, Compass Mining also has very strong relationships with hosting facilities with very competitive uh, electricity costs. So you can buy a miner uh, via Compass and then pick a hosting facility to plug it in on. Uh, Compass will get that miner, send it to the hosting facility, have it plugged in. Uh, then you'll have your sats sent to a wallet of your choice. If at any time during that uh, hosting agreement, if you somehow find cheaper electricity at your own home or in your neighborhood or in your office building, uh, Compass uh, will send you the miner. You can have it unplugged from the hosting facility and then sent back to you. Uh, go check it all this out at compassmining.io, C-O-M-P-A-S-S-M-I-N-I-N-G.io. We also have a very special link in the show notes, a ref link, if you will. Just be honest about it uh, if you want to support the show. That is one way that you can do so. Compass Mining, again, trying to get more individuals into the mining game, more individuals hashing. It's a beautiful mission. Last but not least, this rip was brought to you by our good friends at Brains. Brains is a team behind Slush Pool and the Brains OS Plus firmware. It allows you to stack more sats with your hash. Again, we've been saying this from middle of July. Wednesday, July 14th. Brains team tells me that Slush Pool update is planned for July. They are just triple and quadruple checking everything in simulations to make sure it's as silky smooth as possible, the transition when the update goes live. Meanwhile, the latest Brains OS Plus firmware update includes full support for Antminer S17e and T17e, as well as some significant improvements to the auto-tuning for all X17 devices, and it's available now at brains.com slash OS slash plus. That's brains with two eyes, B-R-A-I-I-N-S dot com slash OS slash plus. Brains OS Plus is compatible with any mining pool. Public service announcement. There's a lot of uh, misconceptions out there. People think that if you use the Brains OS Plus firmware, you need to put point your hash at slush pool this is not true you do not need to mine with slush pool to use the firmware but if you do mine with slush pool you're going to get zero percent pool fees that's their incentive uh to point to your brains os plus firmware hash at slush pool is zero percent pool, pool fees since network hash rate is at one year lows due to the china crackdown now is a great time for miners to juice up their asic with auto tuning firmware and stack even more sats for those that don't know how it works it mostly comes down to the silicon of the hashing chips there are small variations in the silicon quality for every chip in an ASIC. Typically, stock firmwares that come with machines treat the entire device as a uniform unit, sending the same frequencies and voltages through the hash boards. Brains OS Plus boosts performance by experimenting with different frequencies and voltages on each individual chip to learn which chips are higher quality than the others, and it calibrates to send more work to the higher quality chips and less work to the lower quality ones. The end result is a per-chip tuning the end result of this per chip tuning, excuse me, is more hash and thus more sats per watt of power consumed. Currently supported devices are the Amp Monitor S9, S9i, S9j, as well as the S17, S17 Plus, S17 Pro, T17, T17 Plus, and the ones just added, the S17e and T17e. Next up are the Watts Miners, of course. I'll believe it when I see it, Edward, along with the S19s from Bitmain. Stay tuned, TM, for more updates on the firmware. Uh, in slush pool and check out insights i n s i g t <laughs> that's not right i n s i g h t s dot brains dot com again that's brains with two eyes b r a i i n s dot com if you go to insights dot brains dot com you're gonna get content stats charts and mining profitability tools to stay on top of everything happening in the mining industry mining industry big topic of this discussion let me know what you freaks think uh, after a live stream it seems like uh, there's there's a lot of division on this topic but I think this is a healthy topic. Uh, to continue discussing and again like I said picking battles I agree I have to be wise with it I think it's important to fight this battle early and often because we let it metastasize uh, it could be a bigger battle down the road maybe I'm wrong we'll see enjoy freaks Thank you.
You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. Probably should be. Probably should be. Court. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here for a very exciting conversation, a very uh, timely conversation. I'm joined with Michael Saylor from MicroStrategy, Darren Feinstein from BlockCap, and my coworker at Great American Mining, Austin Storms. Gentlemen, how are you guys doing tonight? Awesome. Doing great. Good to All be right. here. Thanks. It's good to be here. Um, I'm sure you guys are aware of my particular thoughts on the Bitcoin Mining Council. That's what we're here to talk about. The Bitcoin Mining Council is it coercive? Why was it started? How does the ESG movement uh, fit into this discussion? Does it have a coercive force on the Bitcoin mining industry in North America and miners that don't participate in the council? Um, and and what are the long term effects of appeasing what I would deem uh, a communistic terroristic movement in the ESG? Uh, movement uh, that is that is trying to, I would argue, control industries top down via the control of capital and influence over board. <clears throat> so I guess we'll start. We'll throw it to Darren and Michael, two members of the Bitcoin Mining Council. Um, uh, what? How would you describe the intentions behind the Mining Council? Why you guys decided to start it, and what your your stated goals are moving forward? Darren, you want to start or you want me to? Yeah, I think I think uh, I could start and then and then uh, I'll yield over to uh, Michael to, to help out. I think what the genesis of really what what's going on is that and, and I've been in the space for a decade. I uh, started mining in 2012 and uh, have, have been really a, a big proponent of the of the Bitcoin networks. Uh, fundamental ideals of of uh, censorship resistant money and and bringing private property to billions of people on the planet and i think what we've seen happen over the course of the history of of this technology is very uh, similar trajectory that happens when all analog systems become digital in that the legacy systems that are attached to the analog systems they they put up a misinformation campaign, and it's and it's really the same every time. Uh, when when mail uh, went from the postmaster general delivering uh, packages and and letters to to all the homes, when mail went to email, the postmaster general he went before Congress and he said, you know, mail is 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 the best and most efficient way to deliver information, and that email uses too much energy because of all the servers that need to exist in order to transmit one email from, from me to another person. And, and, he, and he actually got a lot of support to, to thwart email and put forth uh, regulations uh, that didn't succeed, thankfully, to tax, a stamp tax on every email. Uh, you saw the same thing happen with when movies went from Blockbuster to uh, Netflix. You saw lobbyists come out and say, movies that are on networks use too much energy. Uh, we need to stop this. Uh, you saw the same thing 100 years ago when, when elevators went from uh, human run to electrical. And, and they came out and said, these electrical elevators use too much energy. So it's really the same arguments over and over again when you, when you lose uh, uh, the advantage of an analog system to a digital system. And so being in the industry and, and, and dealing with the uh, constant reverberations of how much energy this network uses, I think you, you, you look towards how do we solve the misinformation campaign that's going on globally and, and very well coordinated against a better monetary technology and better system of private property rights and and uh, and bringing human basic human rights to eight billion humans on the planet, and so when you when you're in the midst of basically a marketing war 
which is what we're in. And we're, and we're the subject of every newscast on the mainstream media, the amount of energy the Bitcoin network uses. You start to see that really the facts are being lost. And the facts are really simple and, and they're, they're, they're really, uh, they're on our side. And so when, when you have a marketing campaign, sometimes the facts get lost. And so really the, the basic premise for me, and you have lots of different Bitcoin mining council members that have their own opinions on what they wanna do. Uh, but for me, what's really important is to educate the public on the actual statistics involved in our industry. And, and there's one statistic that I think Michael Saylor's heard me say 8,000 times, but I'm gonna say it again, is that the, the problem is every, as I said, mainstream media every day, every article, how much energy is being consumed by this system. And it's all false, it's misleading. And the people that bring it up are being intellectually dishonest if they've done any kind of research on the topic at all. And the facts are this, and, and this, statistic, this, statistic is, this statistic is the most important one. The world, the planet Earth, generates 160,000 terawatt hours of energy a year. And a terawatt hour of energy is a trillion watts. And so that's a massive amount of power generated on the world, in the world, every annualized every year. The Bitcoin network, which is the subject of, of probably more environmental uh, concern than any network I've ever seen uh, in my lifetime, uses of the 160,000 terawatt hours of energy, it uses 189 terawatt hours of energy, a negligible amount. It's equivalent to 0.1% of the energy generated on the planet Earth. And when you look at the sources of that energy that are used by the Bitcoin miners, and I happen to be one of them, uh, I know what our energy sources are. And we've located our facilities off grid uh, outside of population centers near majority uh, renewable energy sources. Our first location is, is uh, up in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, it's in North Carolina. It's in the midst of several hydroelectric dams that were built by the United States government as critical infrastructure in the 1940s. And it, they've been repurposed over the years, but you have, you have a massive amount of stranded hydroelectric power that's renewable that exists at a very inexpensive cost because if they don't use it or sell it, it dissipates and it's wasted into nothing. And so a majority of the power that's used at that facility is emissionless. It, has, it, it emits nothing into the atmosphere. And so knowing the statistic that the Bitcoin mining uh, industry uses very little of the world's power and knowing that my company, at least, and some of the other companies that I'm familiar with too, all gravitate towards renewable and sustainable energy sources because the price of renewable or sustainable energy that's stranded, that will dissipate is inexpensive because they're looking to create a market for it. Uh, knowing those facts, and then reading on a daily basis how bad this system is for the environment is extremely frustrating. And so when I've watched what's happened over the last decade, and because this is a decentralized network, and we're really all proponents of decentralization, you've seen a very uh, disorganized method of dealing with the misinformation. And it's, this is, I steal this quote from Michael Saylor, uh, so, but Michael says, just because we're decentralized doesn't mean we need to be disorganized. And so while we're decentralized and we're all proponents of the fundamentals for the, for the Bitcoin network as, it's, as it is uh, portrayed in, in the white paper, the, the messaging that needs to happen to the world has to be simplified in a manner where people can see what the actual facts are. And so the problem on top of the fact that the messaging gets distorted and it's, it's disjointed from so many different people is the fact that people like us on this Zoom, we're very well versed in what Bitcoin is and what the mining entails. And we can talk about terawatt hours of energy or 
kilowatt hours of energy and renewable versus sustainable versus hydroelectric power. But most people on the planet don't know what we're talking about. And so we're, we're really almost in an echo chamber talking to each other when we really need to be bringing this message to the 8 billion people that are on the planet Earth and only a hundred million of them are on this network right now. And so the, the network uh, for the people in the United States where we value uh, freedoms and individuality and, and property. Uh, and, and if you look at people like Alex Gladstein uh, points out that 87% of the people that are born on the planet do not have those freedoms. And so while we're bickering with each other over metrics and the specific ideals, there's 7 billion people on the planet that don't have access to the system. And so I think what my goal is, and, and I certainly can't speak for everybody, but I wanna bring that message forth to the 7 billion plus people on the planet that could utilize this to access basic human rights. And, and really that's, that's why I'm involved. That's why I spend a lot of time with Michael on preparing uh, the information that we distribute and disseminate uh, through the council. And we have no, and if I could speak to the coercion, you know, you don't have to join, it's a voluntary organization. We don't have any teeth. We're not making proclamations. Uh, we're, we're just putting forth information that hopefully benefits humanity and people that lack basic freedoms. And so that's, that would be my response to that. So, and so Marty, I think Darren uh, expresses the frustration of um, a lot of Bitcoin miners. Um, I didn't really know that many Bitcoin miners before a few months ago, but I, uh, they've been coming out of the woodwork. And the message generally is we work very hard, we're doing good for the world, and we're getting beat up on by mainstream media and other randoms uh, for unfair reasons. And I th and we need to come together in order to protect ourselves and advocate our interest. And uh, so Bitcoin Mining Council, but I, I think we should start just with the assumption that everybody, everybody believes in Bitcoin. You know, job number one is to sell Bitcoin. We can't afford to alienate anybody while we're trying to actually sell Bitcoin. We need supportive jurisdictions. That means, I mean, we need to be legal in countries. They can outlaw you. I mean, they can, they can put you out of business. We need supportive agencies like, you know, the tax agencies, the SEC, the regulators. You know, if we have a hostile regulator, they can shut you down. So we need supportive agencies. We need supportive states. We need supportive cities. We need supportive politicians. We need supported platforms, even people that don't buy the buy into Bitcoin, like Apple and Google. If they turn off the apps in the app store, if you can't download a lightning wallet, there's no lightning coming. Right. So we need uh, we need to actually uh, garner the political support of the Twitters, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Apples, the Amazons, et cetera, everywhere we can. Uh, we also need supportive vendors, even the vendors we don't agree with. I mean, there are vendors that trade non-Bitcoin, but we still need them. You know, we need the exchanges. We need the traders. We need the academics. We need derivatives of Bitcoin uh, because a lot of people can't buy the underlying Bitcoin. We need applications of Bitcoin. We need investors. We can't really afford to alienate any, anybody. Uh, I would say what we want to do generally is save our hostility for those that are attacking the core principles of the network. Like you wanna change the frequency of the blocks, you wanna change the block size, you should attack those. That's, a, that's, that's like a, a deathly thing. And I think you should be willing to fight to the death to protect the network itself, like the core principles of the network. But if a bunch of people come together to advocate Bitcoin and meet to do so, and there's a lot, I think we should let everybody, you know, do their thing. I think you you should be able to go out and have your podcast and say what you think helps Bitcoin. I think that the Bitcoin miners should be able to say what they think helps Bitcoin. I I did a quick Google search, Marty. There are 92,000 trade associations in the United States. That means there's a quarter million trade associations in the world. Okay. None of them are coercive. Antitrust code in the U.S. And by the way, I had to hire lawyers and I got an antitrust 
uh, antitrust policy. I'll send it to you after this podcast if you want to read it. It basically says you can't coerce anybody. You can't drive any business activity. You can't discuss any business activity. All the things that, that you might be afraid that the Bitcoin Mining Council would do are illegal to do under antitrust law. None of us are, are, the, va- are the least bit interested in, in coercing, driving, or mandating any business activity of anybody. Uh, what we want to do is to defend ourselves. And, uh, and when you're attacked, and it's a, it's a difficult world. It's a, it's a world with a lot of people with a lot of vested interests. And most of them's vested interest is not to make Bitcoin successful. So, you know, you beat up on me a little bit over, over Bitcoin council, okay? So I get it, council sounds like a scary word. You know, I ran for student council in eighth grade. I lost, I wanted to be vice president. But, you know, it occurred to me that student council doesn't run the student body. And then I went and I checked out councils. You know, Marty, there's a gold council, a silver council, a copper council, a platinum council. There's a medical council, a safety council, a dentistry council, an ophthalmology council. There's world art councils, foreign relation councils. There's a solar council, a wind council, a geothermal power council. There's an automobile council, a pilot's council, an aircraft owner's council, a shipping council, a shipbuilder's council. There's an Atlantic council, an Arctic council, a Pacific council. And if you don't like that, there's an African, Pan-African council. There's corporate councils. None of these councils run the organizations. I found a whole grain council, a US grains council, an international grains council, and my favorite, the National Bacon Council, which does not control bacon. But, you know, the message there, you know, and by the way, if you went to associations, there's an association for everything. You name it, there's, and by, in fact, there's probably a hundred associations for everything, every type of person, every type of thing in the universe. And every one of them is advocating their interest in, in front of politicians, regulators, the media, mayors, governors, you name it, Wall Street, all the time. So, so the fact that the Bitcoin Mining Council is going to actually form as a voluntary association to say Bitcoin's good and Bitcoin mining is good, I, I, don't, I, I don't think uh, it's, it's an irrational or unreasonable thing to do. And I think politically, if we want to protect Bitcoin in the world, we can't afford uh, to take to take the position that um, uh, that we're offended that you questioned our energy use, or we're offended that you questioned Bitcoin's use by criminals or Bitcoin's use by whatever. I've been in business thirty years. I've had thousands, tens of thousands of employees, and I never had an employee that was persuaded if they if they had a concern even if it was a wrong concern if an employee said something stupid blah 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 i heard that microstrategy is boiling the oceans or whatever they're never persuaded by hostility ridicule or contempt like i can't just say that's a stupid question investors are the same way if i had an if i go to an investor and they're saying Tell me what's micro strategy doing with Bitcoin. I heard it's got an environmental issue. I could say I'm offended you asked. You're obviously uninformed. F you. But if I did that, the best that happens is they don't buy. And the worst is they sell. And the even worse thing is they short. And then they tell everybody else to short. And another approach is they ask me about the environmental issue. And I say, well, there's not an environmental issue. Bitcoin is 56% sustainable. In fact, the North American miners are 68% sustainable and it's getting more efficient and more sustainable every day. Don't worry. And then they go, okay. You know, and the same is true with customers. Uh, if you go to your, you know, the customer's always right. So the customer says, oh, I heard micro strategies like investing in Bitcoin. I can say, well, you're stupid to ask, or, or you you know, I'm, if they say, I heard this thing about Bitcoin, it's used by criminals. I can say, I'm offended you even brought that up. You know, your stupid fiat is used by criminals, blah, blah, blah. Well, like I just got into a fight with them over nothing. You know, my customers aren't going to stop using dollars. And they didn't ask the question because here's, a, here's the big idea. 
They don't act, 98% of the people, 99%, they're not our enemy. They're not asking the question because they believe it. They're asking the question because their boss convened a bunch of experts in a room and a random lawyer said, here are the 10 questions to ask them when you meet them. And so some lawyer, and by the way, the lawyer wrote down the 10 questions to show how smart he was. It's like the CEO says, or the investors, I'm going to meet with Michael Saylor. I got to ask him stuff. What should I ask him? So the lawyer says, ask him about the Bitcoin energy thing and ask him about whether Bitcoin will be banned and then ask him about, you know, whether Bitcoin will be replaced by something else and then ask him, you know, whether they're taking too much leverage. Okay. And, and the lawyer did his job. He came up with five objections, five questions, because if the lawyer didn't come up with five objections, the lawyer gets fired. So the lawyer's got to come up with the five objections. The person's got to ask me the five things. I have to give an answer to the five things. If I give an answer to the five things, the investor says, okay, I asked the question. I'm comfortable with the answer. So we bought $100 million worth of the stock. Or I asked the question, I'm comfortable with the answer, so we bought $2 million worth of the software. So you see, they're, they're not really hating us when they ask the question. They're simply going through the process of due diligence. And employees do due diligence, investors do due diligence, customers, voters, and regulators and judges do due diligence. And we have to move through a world of all these people. And here's the big idea. You know, the governor of Texas wants Bitcoin mining, but the governor of Texas might not be a Bitcoin maximalist. So when the governor of Texas, you know, meets with his cabinet, one of them says, I heard Bitcoin mining is energy, you know, intensive or not sustainable, or I heard Bitcoin is used by, you know, malefactors. And the governor of Texas has to say something. And so we need to feed the governor of Texas the truth at least we have to advocate our position. The governor of Texas can't stand up in, in front of the entire Texas legislative branch and say, I'm offended you asked me. I mean, he has to say, oh, I looked into it and it turns out that actually, you know, it turns out most Bitcoin mining sustainable. We didn't even know, not a problem. Everybody's like, check. The person that's feeding the question, by the way, is probably an enemy of the governor. Of, maybe it's the political rival of the governor who just has to come up with something to say. So if we, um, if we advocate our interest when we're attacked on an ESG narrative, um, I don't think it's kowtowing to the ESG haters or communists. I, by the way, I think most of us aren't communists. I, I mean, I don't, I mean, even the- I'm not calling, so- uh, you No, know, I think Hubert. most of us are pretty much capitalists. Where we I know that. Issues floating so, around. so let's clear up a few things here. Uh, I don't think the Bitcoin Mining Council is going to influence other miners. I think the ESG narrative. So when you announced the Bitcoin Mining Council on the 24th of May, you said we're pre present and decided to establish an organization to standardize energy reporting, pursue industry ESG goals. So that's one thing we have to clear up. What is the industry ESG goals? What are we catering to? Why? are we uh, catering to an ESG movement that is completely ill? It was an ill-considered tweet. I would write it differently if I were doing it today. <laughs> but this is essentially, so let's get into the meat of the conversation. This is what I would deem is a potential attack vector on Bitcoin is this ESG influence. BlackRock owns 15% of MicroStrategy stock. Capital Group just bought 12.12% of the outstanding uh, stock and micro strategy as well. Riot has BlackRock in their top four holders. Susquehanna, Vanguard, uh, Mara, same thing. All activist investors with an ESG tilt. They want to take over board boardrooms and push their ESG narrative on those boardrooms and influence those companies to act in a certain way. Like this is well, reality. Like so, the question is like, well, Marty, like there's nothing wrong with doing good things for society, having good governance and doing good things for the environment, right? Well, so, that, well, so like, so, you're not going to get the majority of the people to say they're not in favor of the environment, they're not in favor of the society, and they're not afraid of, well, in favor of good governance. So, well, that's that's what the ESG you're movement... You're painting this in a well, that's, way. Well, that's what the ESG movement portrays itself as, but at the end of the day, they don't give a shit about the environment, they don't give a shit about governance, they give a shit about control, control over 
how industries act. This is evidenced by the fact that the same ESG movement has decommissioned extremely clean nuclear power plants all throughout the world. Like they do not care about the environment. They want to control how businesses in the public market act and they they dangle the capital over the companies and say, hey, if you want this capital, Marty, I, act this way. I got two two observations. One, there's hundreds and hundreds of battles in the world that are being fought, hundreds of them, right? And you have an opinion on lots of them and I have an opinion on lots of them. I, you, I just choose not to express my opinion on most of them because it takes a lot of energy to fight the battle over each of, the, each of those hundred battles. If, if we sign up to a thousand different battles and we fight each one of them with our energy, we're gonna get distracted from the mission of making Bitcoin successful, right? That's the first observation. So yeah, I, I don't agree with everything on earth, but the issue is, do you have to convince everybody to change their mind on everything or can we simply do our best to make Bitcoin successful? Oh. And the second is everything's an attack vector, Marty. Like if you're married and your wife doesn't like Bitcoin and you buy Bitcoin, then your wife might convince you to sell the Bitcoin. So if you go down this path, eventually the only people that are gonna own Bitcoin are gonna be Bitcoin maximalists that are single and independently rich. Because you know, you, you're sponsored by Square and Square is a corporation. And if, and if Square is ever influenced by an ESG activist, maybe they pull your funding. And that means that you're an attack vector for, for, for Bitcoin because you accept Square's promotion, right? So, so every company, every politician, every mayor, every institution, there, yeah. Everybody everywhere, I mean, you can take the argument of, well, people in Texas are attack vectors because if the governor of Texas changes his view, then that puts Bitcoin at risk. I mean, the point is we can't really, we, we can't take the position that because a corporation has other constituents other than, but if you have any constituents, right, then you have to please them, right? Your, your family is a constituency, right? That's that's my point here. So the corporations have constituents, well, but, but they're not all just because like, let's take an example, just because you're a public company doesn't mean that you're not in favor of Bitcoin. Like, don't you think that the Bitcoin miners are the most committed companies in the world to Bitcoin? They okay, stake I, their, I, their fortunes, their reputations, their livelihoods on the success of Bitcoin. There's nobody that's fighting for Bitcoin harder than Bitcoin miners. They're like the path of, they're the line of first defense of Bitcoin, right? I mean, well, I agree. I don't, I'm, I think you're conflating uh, the fact that the ESG movement is the attack vector, not the miners. I don't, again, I don't, I don't believe that anybody on the mining council has any nefarious intentions. I believe they are, the mining council is really naive to think that by appeasing the ESG narrative, anything or attempting to appease them will be successful in the long run. They don't care about Bitcoin's energy mix. They care that they cannot control Bitcoin and they'll just keep moving the goalposts as they have throughout the history of Bitcoin. And I think it's pretty disingenuous. Marty, I think, I think you're getting well, paranoid here. The ESG, not... the ESG people don't care about Bitcoin at all. The people feeding this narrative aren't the ESG organizations. They're actually altcoiners pushing proof of stake that are, that are actually pushing the entire thing well, into, into the I would, narrative. I would argue against that. The EU parliament has a proposal on the table to ban proof of work citing the ESG compliance. Who do you like, think put it into the parliament, Marty? The politicians. Maybe, maybe they were bought off by Ripple or whatever, but the an point organized, is... Maybe an organized lobbyist supporting an anti-Bitcoin organization potentially who knows but again but, you're but, but you want to look he, here's the point if if i wanted to destroy bitcoin and i was one person then i would pick some particular uh, attack vector maybe it's it uses energy and then i would go find uh, a politician and i would say hey it turns out that bitcoin uses you know energy and boils the ocean and the politician might buy into that and if they if they bring that 
to the forefront, then I think it's our job to point out that Bitcoin doesn't boil the ocean and it's a good use of energy. But and if we're constructive and we do that, <laughs> then then we can move forward. But if we again if we start to get I'm, paranoid and assume that the entire world is against us and we get hostile or or we, we ridicule them, then we're going to actually lose the political fight. Uh I would disagree with that. Like the, I, and I think it's disingenuous. But, but you understand, oh, Marty, you've, you're taking the position that you can't trust any corporation or any politician on earth because they're all against you, right? No, I'm taking that's the position. Where, that's I'm where your line leads to. No, I'm taking the position that the ESG movement is real and they want to control industries. This is, there's evidence by the action of this movement. And again, it's just the facts are out there. These ESG activist funds and BlackRock Capital Group own a significant amount of public shares of publicly traded Bitcoin companies and mining companies specifically. And they actively say on their website with their ESG uh, mandates that they, they talk to boardrooms to influence the decisions of those companies. That That's why they buy so much of this stock. And in, in terms of Bitcoin mining, again, I think those this is- Those are investors. They're, they're actually investment companies and, and their I, number one mission is to make successful investments. ESG activists would be NGOs that have no economic motive other than to pursue whatever they pursue. But even then, the, the, the term is so broad. Like, tell me exactly who is the I, ESG? I think we're going down a- the, No, I think this is- a, I, think, I think we're going down a rabbit hole. The, the ESG has a spectrum, right? So you have some NGOs, you have some- for-profit companies that have different mandates and they're all individually tailored to the companies that are pursuing them. And, and they're not, they're not the same. They're, they're unique and they all have different mandates. And right, I think the point is there's besides, like, there's 250,000 different organizations out there. And there's probably 37,000 that would take some line where they would say we're promoting ESG. Like there's no one today. Yeah. Today, today, Everybody is involved to some extent to, and, and there are environmental problems. I mean, there's pollution, there's waterways that are polluted. There's, there is, there are problems in the environment. There's, I agree. there's air that you can't breathe properly. There are people that are subject to poor conditions in the geographic areas that they live. I mean, nobody could argue that there aren't real life, real world environmental problems all over the world that just exists. And, and as, as, as an industry and as individuals, we look towards how do we how do we fix the footprint of some of the wrongs that have been done and, and there have been. And I think putting forth the message, and we're not we're not treating industry standards, we're not I, we're just letting people know that what's happening today on this network is is friendly and it's a ne- it for two things. One, it's a negligible use of power. The Bitcoin mining network globally, it uses a negligible amount of power. And, and people don't understand that. That's the very first fact that is misconstrued globally. So, so ever- an important point is we need to defend Bitcoin, right? Isn't that the important point? I mean, regardless is. of what you feel about ESG, we need to defend Bitcoin. Our choice is either to defend Bitcoin or not. I mean, I, I guess that it's... You've got these two two thoughts. One is, if we assume that the Bitcoin Mining Council is is okay to advocate for Bitcoin, then this other concern is you 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 know you're concerned that corporations shouldn't own Bitcoin, or the is it is it you're against companies, Marty, or you're against public companies? No, I'm against I'm against uh, institutional capital with a mandate to force an ESG movement on industries like this is- i think we're all i think i okay, think we're see, all wait, wait, now wait. you're not in favor of bitcoin now you've just changed to to like you just are on a crusade against mm-hmm. hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars of capital that has nothing to do with bitcoin and you're characterizing like you're characterizing what their agenda is when i don't think they would characterize it that way you're taking I mean- you just You're had you just had an activist fund take over three boardroom seats of Exxon to push them towards renewable energy. Like you, they 
went out and they had the capital. They bought the shares necessary to get the board seats. And now they are forcing Exxon to operate his company in a certain way that otherwise may not happen if those activist investors didn't buy those shares. Would you say that this is not possible with similar ESG funds with Bitcoin related companies? You can't control the Bitcoin network like you can control Exxon. No, but you can Exxon control. Exxon has a, a Exxon like, has a lot of. Problems. Let me be clear. Let me be clear. I'm the Bitcoin network will be fine. I'm worried about the mining industry in the North America. Like as somebody with equity in a mining company, uh, like this is scary as hell because you can push us it's toward. To, it, again, it's really difficult, difficult, and it's stretched to compare Bitcoin miners to Exxon. And I think that's the narrative they want. I'm you not to, comparing Bitcoin to, miners to Exxon. I'm saying is that activist investor attack vector, is that replicable, rep, replicable with Bitcoin companies? Like on a, if, on a, if, cor on a corporate you, level, you, possibly, you, you, right? So on, on a corporate level, but again, the Bitcoin network doesn't care, just like we you, all know. I guess so the question is, what are you worried about? Someone's going to take over a Bitcoin miner and have them stop mining Bitcoin? No, I'm worried that what they're going to they're going to basically force certain practices on the industry in North America. Like if you don't have this type of energy mix, if you don't point at this mining pool, if you don't act in this way, you yeah. have to pay a certain okay, so, tax. But, so, but, wait, but real quick, the mining council, that, that's not what we're. So we all agree on that. So I listen. I think, I, and I'm listening to everybody kind of go in a cir circuitous route. We all agree with that. I, me and me, Michael, and all the rest of the Bitcoin Mining Council. We, that's not our purpose. That's not what we're trying to do. And if that happens, just like what just happened in China, the Bitcoin network will move to and the geographic regions that have the most freedoms. Again, I, I don't think anybody has bad intentions. But the question is: Is that activist investor like? action possible with Bitcoin companies, yes or no? I'm, I'm not sure if it is, but I have a question, Michael, as a, because you are a pretty forward looking, you know, CEO of a publicly traded company. Do you foresee an ESG compliant Bitcoin mining entity having access to easier capital than one who doesn't have ESG compliant standards? Yeah, absolutely. I, look, I, I think that, uh, if we're if we've moved off the BMC topic, if, if we've established that the BMC is just is uh, just a trade association to advocate the interest of Bitcoin, and we can move on. Now we're discussing whether or not there should be publicly traded Bitcoin miners, and uh, and then what's the impact of being publicly traded? And I think the answer, Marty, is that if you're a publicly traded Bitcoin miner and and other entities invest in you, it's just going to make you more successful. And if someone wants to buy the entire Bitcoin miner, or they want to take control of the Bitcoin miner, invest huge billions of dollars of it, and they would like for it to mine with sustainable energy, it wouldn't be a fate worse than death. It turns out that just about every publicly traded Bitcoin miner I know of is already mining with sustainable energy. So I think you're worrying about nothing. I, I don't think there's any risk. I don't, I don't know of any publicly traded Bitcoin miner that uh, that isn't already mining Bitcoin with sustainable energy, but but Bitcoin's a decentralized network, so everybody can mine Bitcoin however they want. Isn't the whole point that nobody controls it? And if you're going to mine Bitcoin with cheap energy, then that's good. And if it's expensive energy, that's bad. And and uh, and I think that the ESG the, the the ESG movement isn't really a the, the the challenge is not that they're all going to buy into publicly traded Bitcoin miners. The challenge is that we don't respond to concerns that legitimate, uh, legitimate. Um, uh, why is why is Bitcoin forced to respond to all this and no other industry is? So, like, why have we every other industry is Marty. Not in the way that Bitcoin is. Nobody you just, cares. You just pointed out how Exxon Mobil has unset, a We're unsettling bankers. legacy banking systems. I mean, so right now we're we're the topic du jour. Everybody is focused on how do we stop or thwart this network. And so you know, and and I think I want if if we're if we are past you know, and just on to the topic of how do we. Uh, put the message out to the to the billions of people on the planet that that the first thing they hear so 
you're you're one of the seven and a half billion people, Marty, on the planet Earth that that doesn't know what the Bitcoin network is yet. And the first thing you read about in whatever paper you have or whatever uh, mainstream media in your geographic area is that there's this new network and it uses a massive amount of power. In your whole life, you've been you've been trained to believe that, that the use of energy is bad. If it, 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 the use of massive amounts of energy is bad and, and they don't understand people haven't been uh, taught that just that use of energy has not the, the Bitcoin servers, they don't emit anything. There's no carbon coming out of a Bitcoin server. There's no methane, it doesn't release anything into the atmosphere. It only releases what the power generation source is. And if it's plugged into the electrical grid, the, the emissions, which is what people are concerned about from energy, the emissions come from the electrical grid power generation source. And so if you're not a novice, right? You don't understand what the Bitcoin network is. You don't understand the property rights that it can provide you. And the first thing you read unabated nonstop is that it's a massive use of energy and destroying the planet. You're going to say, you're going to join the collective group of people and say, we don't want Bitcoin here. We already have enough problems. And so in order to counteract that one thing that they're going to hear first, we've trying to put out the, the package of information that we've put out and I put it out in slides and, and the Bitcoin Mining Council and it's available on Sailor's website. We're putting out slides that show the de minimis use of energy from this network. It's just fake, it's, it, it's misleading, it's intellectually dishonest information that the world's being presented with first. And so like, as we, as we want this network to, to increase the user base, we need the users that are not uh, familiar with it to, to really understand that this isn't destroying the planet. And when I, we have, I have four, we're in four different states, uh, one of the companies that I founded. And when I, I've walked into those factories and I speak to the employees and I ask them in small groups, how many of you believe from what you watch on TV that what you're doing here is destroying the planet? And, and they raise their hand. And, and, it, and it's sad to see that. And so I've come up with the way to explain to them that that's not what's going on here. You're, this is the most sustainable monetary technology that's ever been created in human history. It's the first innovation on accounting front that, that takes the, the accounting system out of the hands of the people that control uh, the books and records for, for companies and, and governments and banks. And it gives it to the decentralized distributed network. And so what, I, and, and I gave you this statistic already. So I walk, I walk our employees through very carefully the use of energy that is going on inside this network and, and what specifically the metrics are of it. And, and when we're done talking, people that were not aware of the energy mix are, are now aware of the energy mix. And I'm not telling them they have to use a certain energy mix or I'm not chastising them. And this goes to other conversations I've had with other people. I, I'm not, we're not proclamating anything. We just want to inform people that, especially the people that don't know what we're doing, that we're not, this is not an energy intensive business as everybody likes to frame it. So Marty, so, do, you, do you think there's any, do you have any, dis, is there any reason we shouldn't just educate the public on the benefits of Bitcoin. I mean, people have been doing it for, for quite a while. There's been an yeah. immense amount of incredible Can content. Can we agree on that, that? That there's nothing wrong with educating the public on the benefits of Bitcoin and pointing out that their fears are overblown. No, I completely agree with that. Okay, so we're constructive then. I think we should just focus on on the constructive issues. I think that they're- Well, so that here's, one, here's one issue ahead. I'd like to talk about. Like, What is the correct offensive against this? Is it to say, hey, look at all the renewable energy that Bitcoin's using. Uh, we're getting attacked by this movement that's like, hey, we have to transition to these unreliable uh, renewable energy sources. Like, is that like appeasing to them? 
the the best strategy or should we be calling out the hypocrisy of the whole movement like there's many logical inconsistencies the fact that solar and wind those supply chains completely or those industries completely neglect the front end of their supply chains that take a lot of slave labor and hydrocarbons to produce the end product they uh when they're actually up and running there could very unreliable and intermittent they're not actually good sources of reliable energy and then uh they're not uh their lifespans aren't as long as they're advertised and then you have a whole uh recycling process that takes a lot of hydrocarbons and toxic chemicals again this whole uh, there's the esg movement is trying to force the world via capital into an unreliable energy mix world where, where we don't have reliable energy and i think trying to cater to that movement is not the best offensive tactic i would argue the best offensive tactic is to call out their hypocrisy and say hey we don't negotiate with terrorists we don't need to listen to you we are capitalists we are going to do what we want well so so i agree that we shouldn't appease but i i don't agree that we should attack i I think that we should be cheerful and constructive and educational. And on one hand, if we can educate the world that we actually are more sustainable than they thought, that's a good fact. On the other hand, if we should, if we should defend the use of Bitcoin mining on all other energy sources and point out the good that comes from Bitcoin mining on natural gas and, and other energy sources, I, I don't think there's any reason we shouldn't do that as well. I don't think, I don't think that we should spend our energy attacking the premise of ESG because I think that's picking a battle unnecessarily with the majority. And uh, a lot of people, you're not, why do you want to win the battle of ESG? You've all of a sudden <laughs> left the camp of Bitcoin and now we're on a crusade because... to defend the interest of, of 10,000 other, you know, organizations and is dissipating our energy right Call, calling people that and by the way if someone asks are you esg friendly they're not a terrorist we should we shouldn't be picking a fight with them they simply have a checklist item they have to ask are we esg friendly so if our answer is we are then we move on to talk about the benefits of bitcoin then we're not picking another fight. We're just constructively moving forward and are addressing their concerns so that they can support us. Because we do, there are plenty of people that we need. We, I mean, a lot of politicians, a lot of jurisdictions, a lot of platforms, we need them to be successful when they ask us, do we believe in ESG? If we say we're ESG friendly and we're, in, and we're good for the environment, good for the society, and we have good governance, then they can check the box, move on and support us, right? And, and so attacking the underlying premise of their question is creating friction and it's creating hostility and it's distracting because we're not going, you know, if, if you ridicule people that ask the question- I think you could say it this way. You're just and, creating and friction. We're, we're all, listen, there's, there's, two, there's two moving pieces here. You have an ESG moving piece and then you have Bitcoin moving. And and they, they're, they're not tied together. Uh, Bitcoin is its own. Not yet. Well, but right now, today, Bitcoin is its own issue and ESG is its own issue as well. What what we're formed, the Bitcoin mining council, we're, and what I am, forget about the council. What, what really I'm concerned with is Bitcoin's message. That's it. I can't fix all the world's problems. And the Bitcoin's message is, despite your dislike of the ESG movement, the Bitcoin network is ESG friendly. It is environmentally friendly. And so that's the message. Like that we're not kowtowing to any movements. We're not appeasing anybody. We're we actually are within the definition. You literally, you and, literally and, had a meeting with Elon Musk and then started the mining council, like that to appease him. You said, "Hey, we had this conversation and we agreed to help get better information. We're so, going to create this council." Marty, what's what's wrong with we're selling Bitcoin? 
we're, well, <laughs> we're meeting people to actually get support for Bitcoin. So meeting with people in order to convince them that they should support Bitcoin and address any of their concerns is just- But, but at the end of the day, or Marty, at the end of the day, Bitcoin is environmentally friendly. I mean, it is. It's, cool. it's a negligible That's, use of power and it uses lots of sustainable energy. I completely agree. That's the point is <laughs> they don't care. Like they're not going, they like know no we can't, energy that, mix is going, but, like we've been educating the markets and individuals about this. There's been a plethora of incredible content about this. There's been data from Cambridge on this. There's been. I want to talk about this point. So, like so there's, what you just said, I really would like to discuss that because that's the crux here. And so you have done an enormous amount of research and work on it. So is Cambridge. And so is Galaxy and multiple other institutions that are part of this Bitcoin network. They've all done it independently. And they've all released this information independently to the wild. And, and we're losing. We're losing. Every mainstream media article, every mainstream media article, just you said in the EU, they, they're not listening. They're not listening to us individually. And so the, the message is, here's, here's you, can, you can use this Bitcoin Mining Council as they've put together the statistics. Here's a chart that shows 0.1% of the energy generated on the planet Earth is used by this network, which is going declining due to the efficiencies of the chips and the hardware. And so here's the stat. It's not this parabolic, you know, in 2017, uh, these guys said the Bitcoin network by 2020 will use all Newsweek said the Bitcoin network uses will use all of the world's energy by 2020. And they took the hash rate and the perceived increase in hash rate based off no efficiencies in chips and said this is what the future is going to look like. And thousands of people quoted that article and it spread to the regulators. And I had to deal with multiple conversations asking about this article because there was no consensus response to that there were lots of individual so, responses so what darren what darren is saying is that, that we have a good answer we need to we need to just deliver the answer in a in a a manner that will get the attention of the mainstream the facts are on our the, the facts that we couldn't have better facts the statistics and the facts. Well, Marty, are I agree. Look, I agree. I just don't think they that. care about the facts. <laughs> they don't. I think maybe one of the issues here is that's, a, that's like, a different problem. No, like, no Marty, I, like, if, if you're being defeatist now, I mean, like, no. <laughs> if I if I give you a hundred people and they all have a concern, our choice is we can not meet with them and say they don't get it, and we can object to the entire question, or we can meet with them and say. Bitcoin's environmentally friendly. And, and we've been doing the world. <laughs> and been... and then it's likely that 98 out of the hundred will flip and they'll be like, okay, great. I got the answer I needed. See, you, you use the word they, and I just want to make the point. Use the word like they don't care, but the, but there is no they, Marty. <laughs> like, like if the governor of a state asked the question, is Bitcoin environmentally ESG friendly? That person's asking the question because a person that works for them said, you got to ask this question, maybe in response to someone else. They don't have a strongly held opinion, so we shouldn't take offense, nor should we assume they've actually, they or even they, everybody in the world's got their own complicated view. We've just got a question that we just have to answer articulately. So if it's more articulate for us to say, we took a survey, 68% of the North American miners or 68% of North American mining energy is sustainable. The governor can say, look, 68% of North American mining is sustainable industry in the world or in the US, right? So now we check the box and we don't have to fight that battle. We'll move on to the next battle. There'll be another one. Right. I mean, and there'll be another one after that. What is what is your definition of sustainable energy? This definition we've been using is renewables plus nuclear. So basically all the derivatives of solar radiation and then just nuclear on top of that. Yeah. OK, because yeah. I think one of the important points that, you know, from an organizational perspective that might make sense is something that Nick Carter brought up last week, tweeting back and forth with me, is that Bitcoin mining for the most part of the next decade will use non-rival energy. 
And I think a lot of the assumptions in the mainstream media right now are that Bitcoin miners use rival energy sources, as in us using energy to mine Bitcoin somehow takes away from somebody else who can't power their air conditioner or heater in the winter. Does that make sense? I think there's a hundred good points to be made about Bitcoin mining and why it's good for the world, right? It's because it's, it's rescuing stranded energy, because it's recycling wasted energy, because it's making, uh, you know, energy grids more reliable, because it's monetizing intermittent energy, because uh, you could go on and on and on. We need to be able to amplify. We want to things. amplify that. That's a great message. I mean, anybody that people asks. don't understand the difference between rival and non-rival. And I mean, that's a very uh, industry specific term that uh, might sound different than what it is. Just, you know, so amplifying that message and, and well, giving it life to the public so they could utilize it to understand what is being used to create this network is really the genesis of why we started talking because the, you know, we might've had, you know, whoever we meet with, or whatever, whatever we do uh, together, that doesn't represent what all of our individual opinions are. And, and really what's important is that message like rival versus nine rival energy or percentage of like, in, I mean, perfect example, China just shut down, right? You know, 90 plus percent of their Bitcoin network, right? And they blamed it on the, 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 the power and energy use of the network. Well, do you know how much energy China uses on a yearly basis? China uses 40,000 terawatt hours of energy a year and they shut off a hundred terawatt hours. It's a negligible amount or a footprint in China. And so what, and so you read all the articles and they're like, Ooh, China's doing really good environmental stuff, they shut the Bitcoin network off. It's like, they just shut off 100 of 40,000 terawatt hours of their energy. The, do you know how much coal they use? Coal, China uses 20, about approximately 25,000 terawatt hours of coal a year. Of the Bitcoin network, which was in Sichuan, like, like we've talked about before, and, and maybe 30 or 40% of that was hydroelectric power, not coal. How much of the 25,000 terawatt hours of, of coal energy was turned off? And so really just understanding the statistics and letting people know that if a country turns off their Bitcoin miners, which they can, that you, you, we just saw it happen. There was an attack on the network, the network distributed and reallocated and, and continued unabated. It had no downtime, no, no bailouts, uh, and it just kept going. And, and it's a really good message that, yeah, you can turn it off and you can blame environmental reasons. But if you look at statistically the percentage, it, it's, it, it's a stretch to imagine that that's what it really was. And so, but that's not, forget about China. That's any country, any nation, any geographic location that, that, that believes that, that this is a, a, a massive amount of power use. And, and so really, and, there's a lot of different, I, you know, we could all talk about a hundred different points of the Bitcoin network. It's, it, it, you know, the depth and the knowledge of it is, is enormous and we can talk about all the stuff forever. But the, the main driver of the most misinformation right now today starts at energy, then goes to illicit activity and some of the other ones. But the first one is energy, is energy. And, and if we could just corral that message together, you know, this is not about the council. It's not about me. We're, it's not about you guys. It's, it's not about miners. It's, it's about the users. And if we can corral the message to the users of the network that what they're using is a de minimis amount of energy, then we're going to have more people that are going to have the benefit of accessing and learning about this network than if we didn't put those messages out. I would agree, but I would, again, I would I would argue these messages have been getting out for for quite some time, and in the mainstream media, you have Nick Carter going on, you have Pomp going on, you have plenty of people going on to to spread this message. And again, like I like, should we be fighting that battle if it it has proven over the last five six years as the energy fud has been popping up 
back up and back down throughout that period? Or should we be saying like, are, are these actually sustainable, renewable energy sources? Do we want a significant portion of Bitcoin mining operating on intermittent renewables like wind and solar? Is that advantageous for the network? Would that lead to hash rate volatility? Like, it, does that make sense in the long run? Thinking adversarially as well. With the ESG movement and the capital that they have, they are funded by the industry that Bitcoin is set to disrupt most massively. Like, and if we're thinking adversarially, as, as adversarially as we can, is it crazy to think that that industry may have nefarious intentions with this capital allocation strategy and ESG for the Bitcoin industry specifically? But I, I think I, I, I don't. <laughs> I, think, I don't think there is an ESG industry. I think ESG is just a constraint. There's thirty trillion dollars a day of AUM dedicated to allocating capital with an ESG mandate, and, and they're I allocating into so. Bitcoin. Like some of those, some of those companies are allocating into Bitcoin. So, I, listen, we could go. I, I think the question really is, uh, how do we all work together to message? properly to the users. And I and, and that's really what the genesis of this is for us. I mean, I, everybody has their own, you know, you have your own uh, battles. I have my battles. Sailor has his, Austin has his. Uh, what, what, we, what we're here today, what I think is why we're all on this podcast with you, you know, on your podcast, Marty, is how do we help, right? How, what's, how do we benefit the network? How do we, how do we help get the message out? And the, and the message that I'm concerned with today and in, in, in what we've been talking about is the energy footprint. And the energy footprint is negligible. So, so I mean, we're, we've all been working to, to convey that and mm-hmm. it hasn't been working in the, you know, for the various methodologies that we've been doing. And so how do we do that in a manner that gets to the public and to the users that this network is not energy intensive. It uses a negligible amount of energy. And it's also, even though, you know, it is what it is, it does strive towards inexpensive stranded renewable energy because these these large renewable energy facilities have been built across the world that have been underutilized to some extent. And if, and if they exist and they're creating energy and that energy is stranded, it, it goes away. So they're looking for customers and those are the best platforms for, for miners to just like Austin's doing with, with his, with his stranded uh, uh, natural gas flare and you guys are, are doing. So I, I do think you, that's the message. Do you guys think it's wise to have a significant amount of the generation mix that Bitcoin miners use to be intermittent or really non-dispatchable when the Bitcoin network itself has been provably the most reliable network in the history of mankind. Like if we take it to its logical end, right? If we push for sustainable energy mixes, nuclear not included because there's not really a clear path towards nuclear at this point. Wind, solar, hydroelectric. Is it wise to base the the majority of the base load of this network the most reliable in the history of mankind on intermittent generation sources. I, I don't really think, uh, I don't think it's, it's uh, our job to figure it out. Like, I mean, it's a decentralized network, right? So if, if, we, if we just come back to the big picture here, Right, the BMC is just formed to advocate for Bitcoin uh, and for Bitcoin mining and answer questions people have. So there's just a, there's a lot of education to do. I mean, the decision as to how to mine Bitcoin is going to be made by individual miners everywhere in the world, and every 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 country, every jurisdiction has different dynamics. There's different types of energy available. There's different laws. There's different regulatory regimes. There's some there are some countries they're not going to let you mine Bitcoin using fossil fuels. It has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with the ESG movement. It's the it's a politician in the country. There are other countries they're going to let you. I I don't think um, I don't think we need to do anything to Bitcoin. 
right? The goal of the BMC is not to drive any particular behavior. I think there is certain behavior being driven. For example, uh, there's a lot more capital available for uh, sustainable energy today in the capital markets, especially the US. If, if you were trying to bring a coal company public, you couldn't raise billions of dollars on, and for a coal company, but it has nothing to do with you or me or my opinion or Bitcoin. It happens to be that third party investors happen to want to finance renewable or sustainable energy more than they want to finance fossil fuels right now in the United States. And but so why is that? That's that's my because like the production and investment tax credits for renewable energy sources have existed for over a decade now and Congress just renewed them last year. Right. So, and so like so you're me, asking the question, why do people have feel what they feel? But my point here is all we're trying to do is grow Bitcoin. We're not trying to fix the world. You know, there's that joke. I'm here. You know, I heard about Bitcoin. I'm here to fix it. And everybody in Bitcoin knows that's very arrogant. Well, so I heard about the world. I'm here to fix it. That's more arrogant. Like the world is the way it is. Right. And so I, I'm not, I don't want to fix the world. And, and uh, if someone wants to invest billions of dollars in, in solar power or wind power or geothermal power or whatever, that's what they're doing. If, if we're thinking about what's best for Bitcoin long term, my point really is we have, we have Wall Street, they have trillions of dollars of capital. They're going to have questions. We need to answer their questions. You have politicians, they have power. They run states, they run cities, they run countries. They'll have questions. We need to answer their questions. You know, you have platforms, technology platforms, they have power. They have questions, answer their questions. So I think every Bitcoin miner should be free to do whatever they wanna do. And the answer in China would have been different six months ago than the answer in China today. And it's different in Kazakhstan and it's changing every single day. I mean, you guys know how fast it's changing. So I, I don't think that, that um, you know, none of us, at least, uh, at least me for certain, but certainly not the BMC is gonna, it has a plan for Bitcoin mining, right? We're not trying to change the way it is. I think that, um, that the whole point of the decentralized network is let the network evolve like what, tell me what country is going to tax Bitcoin next or what country is going to eliminate taxes on Bitcoin next? I don't know. Bitcoin, Bitcoin will evolve and we should let it evolve. But I do think that if someone says an untruth about Bitcoin, then uh, we should actually answer it. And I think most Bitcoin miners have said, hey, we'd like to have some kind of industry, industry association where we can say the Bitcoin Mining Council or the BMC survey said we're 68% sustainable or 56% worldwide. That's just useful to 250 different companies to be able to answer that question. I mean, we just all want to be able to answer it. And if, if we have a constructive answer, uh, if, if I have a constructive answer, why not just give the constructive answer? We're just working to defend the interest of the Bitcoin network and the in the most articulate, effective way that we can. I don't think we're trying to divine, you know, where Bitcoin should head. I don't think anybody knows where Bitcoin should head. And what? there's that saying, you know, you want to make the gods laugh, make a plan, right? If you make a plan, something will change tomorrow. You'll be wrong on that plan. What if what if the answer to the the question about Bitcoin's energy mix that people are asking was we uh, we actually use seventy percent fossil fuels and coal? Would would that would that Effect. We would still they, need a. We would still want a Bitcoin mining council to advocate why Bitcoin is good for the world, and we would and we would develop. But how would, how would because the politicians are going to want us to say why Bitcoin is good for the world, and the media will, and the investors will. So so when they ask, we need to have have the best answer, and we're better off, Marty, to develop a good answer and then arm. 250 different companies with a good answer than for us to say all of you have to figure it out on your own because all 250 companies they all have to figure out an answer they're all going to get the question regardless so all we're doing is just organizing to help out and but the point is like what if the answer to the question was that way how would they react would they arnie there's a thousand questions that are coming 
and another thousand coming but, next but this, week. But this one specific. We're, we're, we're getting focused on this one, but there'll be another one and another one and another one and another one and another one. So the, the whole, I, I think that, well, this is, this there is, isn't one question and there isn't one answer. This There's is the, the one question. question this are is going to advocate Bitcoin or not? This right? is the one question, the question that the Bitcoin Mining Council is focused on. Is like, what is the energy mix? Like, is it like, what if the answer were different? How would these people asking the question react? And does that give us some insight into their intentions? We have a question before us right now, and we did our best to come up with the answer. And the answer is is a constructive answer, right? Yeah, the, the answer is that what, whatever the answer. So, as miners. We know what I know what our energy uh, metrics and matrix is. I know which types of energy that I uh, look to uh, locate facilities near. And I know that the peers in the industry also similarly do things uh, in, a, in a manner to, to locate their facilities near the same types of power. And so just on its face, we know, I know what. I know the responses are going to show that this, this network is highly sustainable, be using highly sustainable energy based on the fact that that's what we use. And so it makes sense to show that to the world. And I think we're, uh, we're, 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 we're kind of going back into the same questions again, but, but I think your point is good, Marty. I think you know, your, your battles are, are you know, important to you. And I think that you do a good job of explaining them to, to you do, you, you do a good job explaining them. And we have our own battles uh, and, our, and my battle, you know, lives and dies on, on what the Bitcoin network is and what we're doing as miners and the rest of the world. I, you know, there's other platforms that, that I participate in in, in trying to, to help uh, society. But for this, this, this is this very simple issue and it's very, and the facts are, are even simpler. The, the network uses a very small amount of energy from the world and that's it. And that's, and that's, what, we're, and that's what we're putting forth, that information. The rest, the rest of uh, what people um, might think that we're trying to push out is just, is just inaccurate. I want to be clear. I don't think you guys are trying to push out anything. I think <laughs> the people who are asking the questions are trying to push things on the network. That's on, on the industry and then potentially down the line, the network. Um, that, that is, I, again, I love you guys, Michael, all of you, the education you've done, the, the, te the fact that 10,000 people have taken your course, the, media attention positive media attention you've gotten bitcoin throughout the last year has been incredible darren as well like i told you last night like i respect the hell out of what you've built in the mining industry and again like i don't think you guys have bad intentions at all i think the people asking the questions do like that's that's where i come from and and we appreciate your perspective and 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 none of our positions are mutually exclusive like i've i've enjoyed reading what you and and i and, and what austin write for a long time I think that uh, very on a very simplified basis, putting out snippets of information that are factually correct could help our narrative on a simplified way. I think it's a very complicated industry and, it's, and you need a lot of information and details about what the network is to understand it. And if we can help to simplify that together or you know, in any type of forum, then we're all for it. And I, and, and that's really what, what the goal is for me. So, yeah, Darren, if I, if I could follow up, yeah, Martin, we wouldn't be here if we didn't respect you and didn't, uh, <laughs> and didn't uh, appreciate everything that's going on in the entire community and what you're doing for the community. And I think we all have the same agenda, which is we want Bitcoin to be successful. So uh, my, primary uh the primary point that i wanted to make coming on the show was was that um the world's a very complicated place and there's lots of constituencies and i have noticed in my in my interactions a lot of times people ask these questions not because they believe uh or because they support the point of view 
though a lot of times they crowdsource the question and they ask it because their boss or their boss's boss said you have to ask a bunch of these questions. And so when, um, like I've had investors ask me a question when I was buying Bitcoin, they said, well, uh, tell me about Bitcoin. And I started to explain the benefits of Bitcoin. And they said, you don't have to explain it. I, I already own it myself, but I had to ask the question. My boss told me to ask it. And so I think that there are some people, uh, there, there, are, there are certain non-Bitcoin supporters, but I think that what you've got is a world which is one or 2% pro-Bitcoin and one or 2% anti. <laughs> And 95%, they just don't know, right? And and in the 95%, we're we're not we're not going to persuade all of them to be Bitcoin maximalists. But what we want to do is we want to build bridges with with uh, lots of them so that we'll get their support to do business in their jurisdiction. Like we want to operate on the Apple Store, so. If Tim Cook asks me whether Bitcoin is ESG friendly, I'm going to say Bitcoin is ESG friendly, Tim. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to pick a fight, even if I disagree with the premise of the question. Not, but I might agree with you. Like I agree, I might agree with you that I, I don't like the premise of the question, but that doesn't mean that the most constructive way to me, for me to move forward is to dispute the premise. I would just think what's the most constructive answer that I can come up with. We've got, you've got lots of constituencies here. You've got, for example, um, Wall Street analysts, and they're going to just analyze this stuff and they're going to form an opinion. And their opinion will either be channeled constructively by us if we put forth the best arguments. And they're not just to focus on ESG. We should be talking about digital property and human rights and, you know, the, ESG includes the S and the G, and the S and the G means digital property for 8 billion people, human rights for 8 billion people, you know, and, a, and I, would ar- I, would, I would argue the and S- we can influence them. I would Sorry. argue the I would argue the SG is cultural Marxism that wants to decide how you hire, what you can do, what you can interact with. Like <laughs> that's like the yeah, ESG, but, like it's a top down mandate. My point, like, if someone's got a billion dollar check and they're in front of you. And they say, I have ESG concerns. Are you ESG friendly? You can either say, we're good for the society. You know, we're decentralized and permissionless and, and fair. And, and it's a very efficient use of energy. Well, and I'm give ha- you the billion dollars. I'm happy, you, you, can, I'm happy or, you said that because it explains the backdrop. Ulysses tied to the mass as the sirens are trying to coax him into the water to eat him alive. Like that is what that billion dollar check is. It's the siren but saying, my, hey. But my point is you could either just say that and get the billion dollars and it's true, or you could choose to interpret the world differently and say, I'm offended that you asked the question and not get the billion. But does and that- so, uh, At some point, are you fighting over, e- are you fighting for Bitcoin? Or are you just fighting over your interpretation of ESG? Because you're, I think you're allowing the ESG battle to distract you from- the more important thing, which is make Bitcoin successful. Well, see, and this is why I'm so adamant about it, because I think this is the best way to defend Bitcoin is because, again, that billion dollar check handed to you by the siren comes with strings to it that force you to it really operate. Doesn't. I, I mean, it doesn't. OK, like, so we'll see if that plays out. So one well, but, question but, I have but this is a very important point I want to make. The person has the billion. They simply want you to point out whether or not you're good for the environment, good for the society and well governed. And now we're fighting over semantics. Most of the world thinks good government, good for society and and good for the environment is good. That's what most of the world thinks. So I believe that as well. That fight, we're against the majority and there's no reason to fight over semantics. Right. That that's the point here. I don't think we're fighting semantics. I think we're, we're fighting intention. Um, I think that's that's what we're disagreeing with here. Yeah, but to, I guess my point again is there there isn't like ninety five percent of the world isn't like the ESG monster that wants to eat you. That's I mean that's not ninety five percent of the world. No, it's the Black Rocks. Ninety five percent of the world is just trying to do their job. Like for example, there's a guy Agreed. that serves you know hamburgers, and he's got rules. And someone that that's behind him said blah blah blah. If the person 
looks like a criminal, you can't give him a hamburger. So you go into the restaurant and, they, and the guy says, are you a law abiding citizen? Because his boss told him he had to ask. And you can either say no, or I'm offended, or I'm good. And get the cheeseburger. And, and so what I'm saying is like, it's not, it's not a black and white thing. These guys have checklists and, and uh, there's a question. If you're a politician, you got constituents. You've got to be able to answer your constituents with a constructive answer. So what, what we're doing, you should fight when you have to fight. That's my opinion. If your back is against the wall and you have to fight, then you fight. But if you don't have to fight and, and you can be constructive and cheerful and go along, then you should. Most of the people that, that we, like, like, don't you fundamentally disagree with something about just about everybody, Marty? <laughs> like, like, for example, like if, couldn't I find a, a position that Google, Apple, Twitter, Amazon, Facebook, every politician has taken that you might have disagreed with at some point in the past two years? Oh, definitely. But you still got to get along with them. I, I, I would agree, but they're not, they're, their decisions don't f directly affect the industry I and mean, they don't direct affect the allocation of capital in the industry either. But I can see your point. Austin, I know you wanted to jump in. What were you going to say? Yeah, I guess like my question is around what I perceive to be a fundamental misalignment of incentives between those who seem to be the impetus behind the ESG movement and their position and disproportionate advantage because of how close they are to the money printer and the candle on effect, right? So you have entities like BlackRock and Citadel and Vanguard and Renaissance and you know the whole slew of them who seem to be pushing this narrative and they're investing in companies. And they're also as close to the money printer as you can possibly be. In a world where Bitcoin and the US dollar can't coexist, they're totally mutually exclusive, which I, I don't think, Michael, is, is a, a belief that you have. But in a world where they are mutually exclusive, does that present a fundamental misalignment of incentives, like tying back to my previous question on the base load of the network being run on intermittent, yeah. non-dispatchable generation? Like, we should be constructive, I mean, it, and, and as opposed to being confrontational. Like, we... There's, if Bitcoin can grow to $100 trillion and be 200 times bigger than it is right now while the United States and the dollar continues to coexist, isn't that good enough? Like, like what if we can just all constructively move forward? I think that, the, that it's a, we don't need to construct win-lose scenarios. It's not really good for us to do that. We ought to look for win-win scenarios. I, I don't think, every, you know, Bitcoin is decentralized. The world is decentralized. There isn't any monolithic actor that's moving in an organized way. For example, Citadel is a, is a supporter of Bitcoin. Citadel's put, they put half a billion dollars into Bitcoin or Bitcoin derivatives. So, so Cit Citadel's not even one thing, right? I mean, all of these organizations are, are lots of different people, lots of different uh, organizations making lots of decisions all the time and they have constraints. And so if you look at it like that, it's, you know, the, the right way to do is let everybody live and let live, like, like find a way for everyone to go about doing their job and, and don't make it unnecessarily confrontational for them. <laughs> but that's what they're doing to us. Like they're confronting us like for no good reason, as we've been pointing yeah. out for years. Maybe. That, that's just a matter of interpretation, right? I guess what I'm saying is you're interpreting certain things that way, but, but you can choose to interpret the world as a bunch of people moving against you, or you can interpret the world as, as there are a set of constraints and lots of people are dealing with the constraints and they're no more in power. They're no more in control than you are of those things. Everybody is, is trying to work their way through a very complicated thing called life at the same time. Like what if, like, like when you work, when you walk into like the, like a, a Walmart, like who's in charge? Like, 
every single person at Walmart, is there anybody that you interacted with that actually was able to dictate how that interaction took place? And if so, who is that one person with all the power? It's, it's complicated, right? Like yes, everybody yes. in the yes. world is like, you get the sense that there's, there's no one person that's able to control, but they're all reacting to forces that are one step removed from them. Like, like Marty, here's a complicated thing. Like I'll say to my attorney, can I do this? And the attorney says, well, I hired another attorney and the other attorney came up with a list of questions. Well, what are those questions? He's concerned about a third attorney, you know? And I'm like, well, who's making the decision? And it's like a person worried about what another person would say about what a third person would say about what a fourth person would say. And you get the, if you trace back to the fourth person, they didn't think they made the decision either. It's almost like a cracking of a whip or some kind of like a shock wave moving through a very complicated fluid flow where everybody is driving everybody, but nobody could really stop the flow of the entire thing. It's, it's inter yeah. interdependent. I agree. It's there's a lot of interdependent variables, and it's it's a dynamic, ever changing, um, I guess, problem that we have to solve as an industry. But at the same time, kind of one of my guiding principles is to mind the incentives, and I, I just I can't differentiate between the incentives of having the advantage of the Cantillon effect and being as close to the money printer as possible, but then still investing in something even as a proxy in Bitcoin that removes that advantage. But I, I think that's where like fundamentally you and I, Michael, have a difference in whether we believe that the Bitcoin and the US dollar can coexist on a long enough timeline. And that's, I don't, I, we'll figure that out, I'm sure. Yeah, if you're, if you're looking for Bitcoin to be most successful over the coming five years, then it, you, you could just start from the premise that it's been deemed as property by the IRS, which makes it competitive with other types of property. So it's going to demonetize real estate and gold and silver and equity portfolios much faster. Whereas, you know, the designation that it's currency would be that it's not taxable and transferable. So it's quite likely, right, that the path of least resistance is simply for, um, for people to sell their gold and buy Bitcoin and, uh, and that's the path that we're on right now. One, one point that I want to make while I've got you guys here is the reason that corporations are beneficial and publicly traded companies are beneficial to Bitcoin is because there's like $100 trillion worth of these assets that are sitting in these entities that by charter, they can't actually buy the underlying Bitcoin it, it might be illegal for them, like there are literally laws where they can't buy the commodity or, or it, they spent 30 years to raise the money and they're, they're governed by the constraints on their charter and they can only buy the securities. And so as all of these companies come public, like the Bitcoin miners, someone that wants to, that wants to support Bitcoin, who's your friend, they can't buy the Bitcoin, they can't self custody the Bitcoin, they can go buy an equity in a Bitcoin miner, or they could buy debt securities in a Bitcoin miner, and they can support Bitcoin. It won't be the same thing. But when they do it, of course, it's going to be a public company, and there's going to be public company issues, and, and you're going to have to comply with those things. And there are more, there's more political pressure in that regard. So you have to learn how to address that. And when you get political pressure, if you address it by constructively, cheerfully responding in a way that's acceptable to the person that asked the question, then you'll get that political support. And if you push back, they just push back harder and you lose their political support. So if, if what we're trying to do is to grow Bitcoin, the path of least resistance is just to grow it as digital property. That's it's, it's, it's not likely, for example, that a governor of a state in the United States is going to support something that's deemed to be a competitor to the US dollar, right? That's not a politically tenable position for a congressman, a senator, a governor, or a mayor, and it's unnecessary. So, so I, I guess, you know, if I, if I had a pet peeve, there's two, there's two fights that we don't need to pick, right? We don't need uh, to pick a fight with somebody's currency and we don't really need to pick a fight with the ESG movement. 
what we could just do is say, Bitcoin is great technology and digital property to build the 21st century economy. Here are all the good things about it. It turns out to be very efficient. It's getting more efficient. It's gonna bring prosperity to your state, your city and your country. And if anybody ought to be, if anybody ought to be threatened by Bitcoin, it ought to be gold in the World Gold Council, right? I mean, if gold went to zero and it was just used as jewelry, I think the world would go on. And, and, and if I gave you a choice, do you want to actually, do you want to take $50 trillion out of gold and sovereign and, and sovereign debt or, or money markets or, or say ETF funds and put into Bitcoin? Or do you want to pick a, a fight with a government? I think the answer is we'd probably rather just demonetize some other types of property. Like wh why do we need to monetize our houses? Like to keep the focus on that. You'll get the support of every mayor, governor, senator, congressman, and government if what you're doing is making housing cheaper and doing it in a socially responsible way. I mean, that's a constructive message. I don't think we need to fight the other battles. So eat the hamburger. <laughs> eat the hamburger. Well, they, the other question is is do we even have that decision? Did, did Satoshi make for it, make it for us in the, uh, the onset of the network? But we have a hard 90 minute stop on this. It's been an incredible conversation. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Sorry if I got competitive at times. We're obviously all passionate about Bitcoin and its success in the long run. And again, I think we all have the best intentions in mind. It's just, um, I think this is a very constructive conversation that, that people are going to enjoy. So I want to thank you all for joining and if you either of you any of you has a, a last word or note that you want to end it on let's wrap this up yeah well, th thanks for inviting us on the show marty and i, I think you hear from darren we're, we're darren and i are both very enthusiastic about bitcoin bitcoin mining and we want to do what's best for bitcoin and number one issue is just how do we how do we all work together and and constructively channel the best advocacy messages because there's a world of people 98 percent of the world just doesn't know the answer to the question they don't they don't have a strong opinion one way or the other and so what we want to do is i i don't think we're going to convince the haters what we want to do is find the people in the middle that haven't formed an opinion and we want to persuade them to our point of view and so we're 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 fighting for everybody in the, in the center with uh, with everything uh, that we put out there, and so any, anything constructive we can do that I think is helpful. Yeah, that's great, and I, I appreciate I appreciate both you guys and what you guys are doing, and and, and you guys are doing a really good job uh, uh, with your messaging and, and and the companies that you're forming, and and it's nice to be here, and 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 both Sailor and I discussed coming on here, and and we respect uh, and we've listened to your podcast in the past, and. And uh, it was a pleasure to a pleasure to have a conversation with this stuff about you guys. Please. Yeah, thanks for having us, Darren. I'm honored to be your first podcast. This is, yes. uh, this then, is huge. I wasn't going to bring it up, but yes, my yeah. very first, the only the only one that I've accepted in my first mm -hmm. podcast is is with Bent today. So it's, <laughs> I, had, I had some help with Sailor in, in Austin, but well, uh, yeah. Again, I'm honored. Thank you for joining us, Austin. Anything to wrap up with on your end? No, I appreciate you guys coming on. It's always great to hear. Uh, kind of a differing perspective on something that we both have strong beliefs on. So I appreciate it again. Thanks. All right. All right. Thank awesome. you guys. Thank have you a guys. great night. Peace and love freaks. Live stream.